This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. From time to time, we take a moment on a Sunday to learn from Monsignor Ronald Knox, one of the great translators of, this, of sacred scripture and great homilists of the late 19th into early mid 20th century. He was an Englishman, translated the Knox translation of the Bible, the uh, there's a Protestant Knox translation translated by somebody else, but if you go to Baronius Press and a few other places, you can find the Knox translation, which is an acceptable tr uh, translation for traditional Catholics. Although some serious scholars who like to use the scriptures for much deeper study than the typical Christian needs prefer the Dewey Rames, but the Knox is more accessible, and I do recommend it. Here he gives us a talk about the visible church which will upset Protestants, of course, because he goes after Calvin, especially with a ruthlessness in this that is commendable. But he also goes after those who, being scandalized by the crisis in the church, he uses those words a hundred years ago or more, want to leave the church. This is a message for you, a message for me, a message for all of us today. The church, a visible institution. Many are called, but few are chosen. See Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. This solemn warning, twice repeated by our Lord at the end of two different parables, points to the background of our elder brothers against which we ought to read this part of his preaching. In both clauses, it gives the lie at least to popular ideas about the kingdom of God. For that kingdom, according to the view of his hearers, was to exist, at least primarily, for the sake of our elder brothers, a tiny minority among the peoples of the world. Many are called is as much as to say, more are called than you think. On the other hand, allowance was seldom made in their theology for a kingdom within which a further selection was to be made before the work of salvation was accomplished. Few are chosen, our Lord tells them. It will not be by mere right of birth and nationality that they will be able to claim an entrance. Many are called. Not all the saved will be among our elder brothers. Few are chosen. Not all of those of the Old Covenant will be saved. It is noticeable that these words, so open in their exposition of the truth, are used after two of the latest parables, spoken only a few days before the crucifixion. I do not think it is fanciful to see in such indications as this a progressive fullness of revelation about our Lord's public teaching. But the words have theological importance for a controversy of, of far more recent times. For the word ecclesia, which we translate church, means simply, by derivation, that which is called out, applied first to the congregation of Israel under the Old Covenant, and as such a familiar word to our Lord's own contemporaries, it naturally was used to describe the body of his followers under the Old Covenant. The many who are called, then, constitute the church, the thing called out, and the fact that many are called but few chosen means that the church is something other than the whole body of the redeemed. The ecclesia is one thing, the elect are another, and it was the capital mistake of early Protestantism that it never realized that. Now, in two at least of his parables, our Lord did definitely condemn the idea, which a too literal or too important impatient interpretation of certain prophetic passages had made common among the old covenant followers, that when the Messiah came to the earth, it would be the signal for a millennium, in which sin, and with its, all its miseries, which are consequences or visitations upon sin, would have wholly disappeared. We have already seen that the kingdom of heaven, though worldwide in its invitation and worldwide in its influence, is to consist in itself only of a selection of souls called out of a sinful world. We are now to be taught that even within that church, that selection, there will be evil mingled with good, until the day shall declare it, and the fires of a world's disillusion shall refine the tried gold of the celestial treasure. Cockle sown in the field by an enemy's hand, while the good man of the house was asleep. What? Did God sleep? We shall see later that when God is said to sleep in these parables of our Lord, it means that he permits what is going forward without positively willing it. So our Lord himself slept with the storm raged around the little boat on the lake of Genesareth, the apostles' boat that typified his church, not that he was blind to the danger of the situation, but because he wished in that manner to test and foster the faith of those around him. God then permitted what followed, and the devil lost no time in sowing the bad seed. He made a traitor out of Judas within three years of his call to the ministry. 
We are in error if we speak of the uncorrupted Christianity of the primitive church. There never was an uncorrupted Christianity. The cockle was there before the good seed had time to spring, and springing up, it does so with healthy growth and clinging roots. It is one of the grim paradoxes of gardening, and has even passed into a proverb, that your weed thrives more stoutly and clings more closely than the flowers you cherish, nor is it less showy than the good grain. Who has not seen a cornfield so thick with poppies that from some distant hillside he misnamed it a poppy field? So in the church God's chosen seed plot, the nursery of all sanctity, evil can strike deep roots in human souls, be their position in the church never so exalted, can cling there with a desperate obstinacy, and can flaunt itself in such a way that the careless onlooker will see in the church nothing but a tangled mass of foul growth. Be shocked, be grieved, be indignant at scandals in the church, but if you are a disciple of the Lord's parable, do not be surprised at it. The worst of it has been foretold. A net cast in the sea, gathering together all kinds of fishes. What? Did not God leave his church the power of the keys? Did he not mean that the exercise of that power, the unworthy, should be repelled from communion, expelled if need be, for the contumacy from the body of believers? How comes it that the meshes of the net are too fine to be let out of the worthless catch? We only know that it is so. That's still liable as we are to human error. We dare not judge one another's motives in matters of conscience, except where contumacy makes the sinner clearly unworthy of participation in the privileges of the church. But we know there are those in the net who will be brought to shore, yet be rejected there as unprofitable. The lesson of these two parables is especially valuable because they contradict not only the preconceived idea of the old covenant followers of what the kingdom of heaven would be like, but also the Protestant idea, the real Protestant idea, of what the church ought to be like. Since the primary purpose of the church is, as we have seen, the separation from the world of the souls that are to reach heaven, there is a constant tendency in Christian thought to restrict the ideal of Christian or Catholic to those who are, as far as human insight can judge, going forward on the way of salvation. To set up a sort of church within the church, consisting of the saved, of those who combine spiritual gifts of a high order with a delusion. And the delusion is that because they are Christians, because they have believed in Christ with a saving faith, nothing can ever interrupt their progress. Nay, nothing that they can do be really sinful, seeing that their consciences are now enlightened by the Holy Ghost. There must have been something of this feeling abroad among the early Christians at Corinth, since St. Paul is forced to take up his master's parable and warn them that it is not enough for them to be Christians any more than it is enough to sit start in a race. All run indeed, but one receiveth the prize, and in the same way there may well be many called by the name of Christ who will not reach the prize of their high calling. The Israelites, he says, were all baptized in the Red Sea, all ate of the heavenly manna and drank of the spiritual rock, yet only a remnant of them attained to the land of promise. So in the new covenant we Christians all escape from the bondage of sin through the waters of baptism, are all refreshed in our pilgrimage by the very body and blood of Christ. Yet the inference is not hard to draw. He that thinketh himself to stand, St. Paul concludes, let him take heed lest he fall. This dangerous tendency, with its accompanying delusion about the salvation of the individual concerned, occurs in different forms at different periods in church history, but never more logically than in the system preached by Calvin and his followers in those parts of Europe where the old religion had been stamped out. The Calvinist church is, in its whole idea, a church of saints. To say that you belong to the church and to say that your soul is infallibly bound for heaven is to say the same thing in two different ways. The world is therefore cut in halves by a terrible dichotomy. Those who belong to the church, that is, those who feel an interior conviction that they are destined for heaven, can do no wrong, because they are in the grace of Christ and the others. For all the rest of the world, every act, every word, every thought is unsanctified by grace and therefore sinful. I have God's warrant, could I blend, all hideous sins as in a cup, to drink the mingled venom up. Secure my nature will convert, the draw to blossoming gladness fast, while sweet dews turn to the gourd's hurt, and bloat, and while they bloat it, blast, as far from the first its lot was cast. Not all Protestants have followed the ruthless logic of Calvin into his speculation about irresistible grace, but Protestantism, wherever the word has stood for a consistent body of thought, not for a mere loose series of half-truths and negations, is bound to follow him in his belief that the church is simply the assembly of God's elect, that the holiness of the church consists in the fact that every member of it is sanctified, that there will be no Christians in hell. St. Paul, as I have said, was at pains to warn his Corinthian converts against any approach to such an error. 
He tells us that you can be a member of the church, and he's thinking of the church as an institution. And why should he refer to her to her two chief sacraments, and yet come short of grace, and so fail to reach eternal life. This sounds very obvious to us, but do not make the mistake of thinking it has no theological importance. For the whole controversy about the true church is not whether it is the Roman Catholic Church, or the Greek Church, or the Anglican Church, or some other definite religious body. The real controversy is this. Is the true church of Christ a visible or an invisible institution? 90% of the people who reject the Catholic Church reject it, not because they really believe in some other visible church, but, but but because they do not believe in a visible church at all. Therefore, it is of great importance to know whether St. Paul taught, and of still greater importance to know whether our Lord taught that the church was visible or that it was invisible. And if the church is invisible, if it is not a clearly defined body of people bound together here on earth by common faith and common institutions, but merely a number of souls known only to God who have really received with a lively faith the message of his kingdom, merely the sum total of all the people in the world who are really Christians, then... Why, then, there are no bad Christians, no cockle among the wheat, no worthless fish in the net, no unsuccessful starters in the race of Christian perfection. And St. Paul's reference to the children of Israel who were baptized in the Red Sea and ate the heavenly manna and then failed to reach the land of promise is without point. It may be objected that the field in which the cockle grows is the world, not the church. The field is the world, our Lord himself says, and that the cockle growing among the wheat only means that Christians who have to live in the world among wicked people are not Christians. But if so, why should wheat and cockle be so hard to separate? And in any case, what of the net? There surely, if words have any meaning, the sea stands for the world and the net for the church, and there are bad fish in the net. Very well then, bad Christians, members of the church who will not reach heaven, either reject these two parables and two whole chapters of Corinthians as spurious, or else admit that the church our Lord founded, the church of St. Paul preached, was a visible institution with bad members as well as good. Many are called, but few chosen. How solemnly our Lord says that. And what is the church? The ecclesia. And what does ecclesia mean by derivation? The thing that is called, not the thing that is chosen. Many are called, but few chosen. To talk of the church as an invisible church is to make Christ a deceiver. St. Paul, after describing the way in which the Israelites, after all the privilege, spiritual privileges which had conferred on them, were not found worthy, most of them to enter the promised rest, he adds, Wherefore, he that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed lest he fall. He himself, he explains, apostle and preacher of the gospel, as he is, takes the discipline for fear that he himself should fall from grace and become a castaway. All of us who have become members of the church have duly entered ourselves for the great competition. Call it a race or a fight, which you will, it is quite another thing to ensure that we run prudently, fight effectively. It is, he says, a matter of training. He that striveth for the mastery refraineth himself from all things. But as you say, I have been baptized, redeemed with the blood of my Savior. He is not likely to leave his work unfinished in me. That is what our elder brother said, answers St. Paul. They argued that because God had brought them out of Egypt and led them through the Red Sea, he was certain to bring them into the land of Canaan. Were they right? But I am a regular communicant, fortified with the body and blood of Christ, who himself has said that whoso eateth of his bread shall live forever. I know, answers St. Paul, and that is what the the holders of the Old Covenant thought. They argued that it would not have been worth God's while to support them on their pilgrimage through the wilderness, opening the doors of heaven to rain down bread upon them and bringing water out of the rock if he meant them all to perish in the desert on the further side of the Jordan. Were they right? The people who had been brought out of servitude in Egypt with miracles and catastrophes of nature turned their affections back and pined for the old food, the old customs, the old false gods of their servitude. These things were written for our correction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Therefore, he that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Let us then learn correction, learn to refrain ourselves from all things, that by mortifying the senses, by self-imposed silence and solitude, by making a special campaign against some ruling passion of our lives, be insisting upon, and if need be, revising our rule of prayer. We may become worthy of the vocation by which we are called. We may be found pure grain fit for a king's garner, a prize safely landed at the feet of the fishermen of souls. By God's permissive will, the cockle is allowed to grow up with the wheat in the church. It is his will, but not his wish. It is impossible that scandal should not come, but woe to him through whom they come. 
There is no single excuse so freely used by people who want to justify themselves in remaining outside the church as the behavior of some of us who are inside it. The fact that moral laxity, carelessness, and formalism could be pointed to in so many parts of Christian England was a rallying cry of the apostasy through which England lost the faith. There is nothing more jealously watched or more bitterly criticized today by people who criticize religion than the behavior of professed Christians. Fifty years ago, people who did not pay very much attention to what we did. Today, when the Catholic Church is the only considerable religious body that dares to claim an increasing and not a diminishing membership, we have a heavier responsibility. More and more, even in England, the Church becomes a city set on a hill, whose doings cannot be hid. More and more, it may be, it will fall to her to be the salt of the world in which she lives. The stronger the light beats on us, the more clearly outlined motes though we be in the rays of it, do our lives appear in the public scrutiny. We do not want that scrutiny, so often pharisaical, to make hypocrites of us, but do let us take some care, not only about motives as God sees them, but about the external appearances of our actions, lest they should be keeping back souls from God. Nor knowest thou what argument thy life to the neighbor's creed hath lent. Do not let us give the impression, as far as it is in our power to avoid it, that the infinite patience of our mother the church is habitually misused by her children, and that the gentleness of her rebukes is demoralizing. Yes, Protestants will tell you that, to the consciousness which she directs. A scandal carries further than a tale of sanctity. Our Blessed Lady lived and died unknown, but all Jerusalem knew when Judas ended himself. Truly a worthy message for all Christians scandalized by the crisis in the church, and who have been contemplating leaving the church. Do not follow such temptations. You will not find salvation elsewhere among schismatic groups with stolen sacraments, or among Protestant groups who have replaced any semblance of sacrifice in their worship with rock and roll praise and worship nonsense. You will not find salvation there. Cling to the rock of Peter. Cling to the church. Even in this time, even when our leaders are intoxicated with their own hubris. Let me know what you think of this in the comments, please. To like and subscribe if you haven't, it does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.